your God that we cannot see, just a presence in the sky, only a mystery, but I believe there's more to you than meets the eye, and I see a little more of you. at Hampton Presbyterian Church. I know it's a dreary day outside, but the spirit is here. So please stand, join us while we sing. How can I keep from singing? Thank you. 
I'd like to invite the children to come forward, please. Good morning, everyone. So great to see all of you today. So today I brought a little show and tell. Today I brought some of my favorite children's books. And I wonder if you've ever read any of these. Have you ever read like Thump, Quack, Moo? There's a whole series of them like Click, Clack, Moo and Giggle, Giggle, Quack and Duck for President. Have you read some of these? Hilarious. Oh my gosh, love these books. Okay, or um, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. Have you ever read that one? Yes, I love that one. So funny. A pigeon driving a bus. Just the thought of it. Um, okay, or Pete the Cat. Have you ever read Pete the Cat? Yeah, yeah, I love Pete the Cat. Or what about, there is, it started out with If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, and then there was If You Give a Moose a Muffin, then there was If You Give a Pig a Pancake. If you, I mean, the series went on and on. I love them all. This one is If You Give a Dog a Donut. Yeah, yeah, they're really funny. I love these books, so funny. Or, oh, Doobie Doobie Moo. That's when they went to a talent show. Yeah, I won't give away what happens. In case you all want to read it. Um, ooh, Bear Snores On. Have you ever read that one? I really like that one, too. Do you have that book? That's so cool. Well, okay, so I'm going to use a fancy word that a lot of you big kids probably would know. If I said that I really liked the authors of these books, what would I be talking about? What did the authors of these books do? What did the authors do? Do you know? What did the authors do? They wrote the book. Yes. And so these authors wrote these books. And I think they did a really great job writing these books. I really enjoyed these books. Well, did you know that there are at least three places in God's Word, which is another favorite book of mine, there are at least three places in God's Word where Jesus is referred to as an author. Did you know that? And so then I started thinking, I wonder how Jesus being an author is similar to like what we think of as an author. And I was thinking, okay, so an author creates things, right? So these authors created these stories. Well, guess what? Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the author of life, of everything. And then I was thinking about how in these books, I bet when the authors wrote them, they had to like take a lot of time with it. It's not like they just wrote it on the first time and it was boom, masterpiece. They were very patient with the writing process. They were very patient as they wrote these books. And I was thinking how Jesus is so patient with us. And Jesus helps us as we get to know him better and as we learn what it means to follow him. Jesus never gives up on us and says, oh man, Karen has messed up too many times. Boop, she's out. Jesus is very patient with me. And he is the author of my faith. And he helps me on my road of faith, okay? And then I was thinking about how the author really knows, like if you asked the author of this book to talk about this book, the author would be able to tell you everything. The author would be able to tell you why they wrote it and what they wrote about and all the things, the whole process. The author, the author would be able to speak like they really knew the book and they really knew what they were talking about. Well, guess what? Jesus is the same. Jesus knows what he's talking about too. And Jesus knows each of us so, so very well. Yes. And when Jesus speaks in the Bible, it says he spoke with authority, which authority has that word author in it. And so Jesus, there were a bunch of times where Jesus spoke like he knew what he was talking about because he did. And people were so amazed. They were like, whoa, this guy, he really knows what he's talking about. He's not just some guy who's like, I think I know, but he's speaking like he knows what he's talking about because he does. And not only did he speak with authority, but he also did things with authority and he healed people and he did miracles and he did so many amazing things because he knew and he had that confidence in God because he was God. 
And so he was able to do things that nobody else could do. And that is really, really cool. So when we put our faith in Jesus, it's not just like, ah, oh, maybe he knows what he's talking about. Maybe he's kind of a good guy to follow. No, he's like the real deal. He is God. He knows us. He loves us. And he is worth following. All right? That's a pretty cool thing. So please pray with me. You can repeat after me. <clears throat> Dear Jesus... We thank you for being the author of life and the author of our faith. Thank you for loving us. We love you too. Amen. skill to understand what God has willed, what God has planned I only know at his right hand stands one who is my savior I take him at his word indeed Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find a need Of Him to be my Savior That we will leave His place on high And come for sinful men to die Strange the ones behind Before I knew my Savior
We've got God's truth that's before us, and we need to attend to it. So let's turn to uh, Mark chapter 1. This is an amazing text. And um, what the Holy Spirit's done with this one today, it kind of gets us between the eyes. But I'm going to invite you to hear God's Word. as captured here in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately... On the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him, and they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is God's truth, my friend. Thanks be to God. Let's do some praying. Oh, Lord God Almighty, it really is a good thing for us to gather in this space. To have this time set apart to encounter your truth, to be nurtured by one another to be challenged by your word, to seek to get to know you. So even now, as we attend to this, your holy word, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts would be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I thought we'd have a little bit of fun to start out this message today. So uh, here it comes. Of the great and powerful Oz, I said, come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you'll keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures, think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh, the great Oz has spoken. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. (laughs) I love that line. I'm a humbug. You humbug. I remember as a kid, man, you know, it used to be broadcast TV and Man, I couldn't wait until that came on. It was like November or something. For whatever reason, I think it was around Thanksgiving, and we'd always look forward to it. And I had 10 years in a row of watching The Wizard of Oz, and, oh, yeah, The Flying Monkeys, that was awesome. For Becky, that was the thing that kind of freaked her out to not want to watch The Wizard of Oz. But that scene, right? <laughs> Peel back the curtain, Toto. Let everybody see and know what really is going on. Right? Really get to know the Oz that's there, the wizard. Uh, That's something. Here we are in the middle of this springtime season of some sorts. It's supposed to be winter, but uh, the snowdrops are coming up. Our daffies are pulling up out of the ground. But here we are. What is it we're seeing? We're seeing all these presidential candidates and kind of whittling down. And what is it that they're trying to do? Peel back the curtain on the other character and saying, look, this is who they really are. Now, you don't know them at all. Here's who they really are. I'll tell you who they are. You think you know them. And some of them are standing up and saying, this is who I am. Come and get to know me. And we're sitting there going, ah, 
Who are you? Do I know you? Do I really know you? You know, Becky had this one <laughs> practice that she had done, not so much anymore. And <laughs> it's kind of funny. So she'd take these deep dives into the internet, right? Dive down into the character study of certain people that she remembered as a child. You know, famous people. And wanted to dig up a little bit more information about them. Get to know what some of their history was. What their life was. What... I just said, oh, Beck, that's dangerous waters. And all of a sudden, she'd come up for air gasping. And I said, yeah, Beck, no, you don't want to know what's going on there, really. But then they peel back, and you see, and you're like, oh, my gosh. What is this? What is going on? Do we really know what's there? I sit there and I think about our text today. And it's an interesting text, is it not? Jesus is in the synagogue. There he is, up in Capernaum, Peter's hometown, right there on the, river, on the lake. <laughs> he walks in to teach, and there's a guy in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. Right? That's how Mark records it. Luke says an unclean spirit with a demon. Wow. And that guy, what's he do, man? I have a funny feeling he feels like he's Toto. I'm going to peel back the curtain on this character. He's just putting on a sham. This is a masquerade. I know who you are. You're Jesus of Nazareth. You're just a man, really, is what is being said there. But you are the Holy One of Israel. Don't be kidding anybody here. You're not just a man kind of flutzing around through the creation here and teaching people. You've got bigger things going on here. You're God. Whoa. Wow. You're in that synagogue, and what do you do with that? Wait a minute. That guy, that starts all kind of questions in people's heads, right? Right? What does this mean? What's this guy doing? And Jesus calling that unclean spirit out of the man, and all of a sudden, things change, right? But the, the question remains, do we really know Jesus? I thought he was the carpenter's kid. I thought he was from Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? Isn't that what Nathaniel said two weeks ago when we talked about him? He's just a guy. He's just some great teacher, right? He knows what he's talking about. He's pretty cool that way. We see him on The Chosen. He makes it really nice and cozy for us to watch him. Right? Do we really know Jesus? And this unclean spirit pulls back the curtain and says, Oh, no, this is God, man. What? A God man? Fully, fully God, fully man? What? My Hebrew brain cannot make sense of that. There is only one God. He's not in the flesh. Isn't this what we struggle with? Right? What does it mean to know Jesus? What does it really mean for us to know Jesus? We spend a lifetime. There's tons of people trying to figure this out. Who is Jesus anyway? What does this mean? We struggle with this all the time. Trying to make sense of this reality that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 kind of puts it out there for us, right? And Eugene Peterson has that playful translation in his paraphrase. He came and moved into our neighborhood asking for a cup of sugar. But John goes on and he says, you know, he came into the world and the world did not know him. Yeah. They didn't know their creator. What does it take to know Jesus? Disciples struggled with this. 
later on in John, we see that again in John chapter 6 when he talks about the bread and all that that goes on. He says, hey, you know what? Here's the deal, folks. You're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> what? And a lot of people boogied at that time. A lot of people took off. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, are you guys going to take a hike as well? And it was Peter who said, you're the one with the words of truth. We have come to know, is what he says, we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Wow, there's an affirmation. But still, where does that put us? How do we get to know Jesus? And for Peter to say that, it reflects a reality that he has come to know and the rest of those disciples have come to know. Why? Because a relationship has taken place and also because of what Jesus even, even said. As he would do these miraculous things, he would say, these are done so that you may know that I am he who has come. We witness these things. We see these things. We experience the power of God in front of us. And it becomes that which creates our capacity to know him. This is what the disciples were affirming, this relationship that's there. Jesus goes on and he talks about this in John 10, about the, about the sheep, you know. And, and I keep referencing John because John is the one who's taking on this platform because the society was so huge on trying to understand and have this knowledge thing because of proto-Gnosticism that was existing there at the time. And he said, okay, let's talk about knowledge, would we? Let's put it out there for everybody to talk about. How is it that you know Jesus and he goes on in John chapter 10, and he says, here's another story about Jesus. He said, yeah, this is the reality. The sheep know the shepherd. The shepherd knows his sheep. And he calls out those sheep by name. And the sheep, and they come and they follow him. That's pretty cool, right? Because they're spending time with him. They're spending time with Jesus. This is what we know this is the thing that's pretty sweet to acknowledge. The funny thing is, <laughs> as we sit there, what does it mean to, how do we get to know him? By following him. Is that some of the scribes and Pharisees were being, <laughs> were being told by people in Jerusalem. They said, you know what? We got a funny feeling that you really have a hankering for Jesus. <laughs> They're like, what? I said, yeah, you're following him all over the place as if you want to hear what he has to say. Matter of fact, it's kind of telling us that maybe you know something that we don't know. That maybe he really is the one that we should be anticipating. And, oh, man, did that get into their craw? Because they're in the midst of trying to figure this out too. How can it be that there's a man saying that he's God? And they were calling him on it. And they were doing it in a bad way. Right? They had malice in their intent. That's what we see in the three catch questions that the synoptic gospels present. John kind of presents it in another softer way with Nicodemus. Because the three catch questions, those scribes and Pharisees, they came up to him and said, hey, we know that you to be. They put on this icky sweet kind of persona because they've been following around him all this time and Jesus knows their heart. He sees right into their heart. He says, oh, Jesus, you know, we, we know you to be a, you know, a great teacher and nobody can do these amazing things that you have done without them coming from God. And Jesus saw right through all that charade. We just want to know. Yeah, yeah, right, you do. You're just like the unclean spirit that's in the synagogue. You're looking at it and saying, this is a sham. Can't be. You're really just a man. Or you really are God. <laughs> and you're pretending to be a man. Oh, man, that gets things kind of shaken up a little bit. And the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, 
you know, there was Nicodemus. Hey, we come to know that, that you're some kind of great teacher. But I, I, we're just trying to figure out how, how, what is going on here. And of course, Jesus just pours out the compassion and empathy for Nicodemus because this is what Jesus does. He loves us, right? But the reality is we're going to respond to Jesus in some of these ways, some ways sort of like Nathaniel two weeks ago who encountered Jesus and said, you are the Holy One of Israel, the Son of God. Right? Remember when we talked about that? And he did that with an integrity of heart and spirit and a joy in his heart that just couldn't be contained. And then you have this unclean spirit guy in the synagogue. I'll tell you what, I've been doing church leadership stuff or been in leadership within the church since I was in 11th grade. I've seen a lot over the time. How people are, people that come into the church, who they are. You've got people like Nathaniel, and you even have people like the unclean spirit, right? Because the translation there is ceremonially unclean by the Levitical law. And to me, I look at that, I think, huh, you know what? Jesus told those scribes and Pharisees, he said, yeah, you wash the outside of your cup, but the inside is filled with filth. You're a whitewashed tomb. You're stinking dirty. You're unclean. And by the law, you shouldn't even be in this facility. But here you are. And you know what? The years that I've been in the church, I see those kind of people. They come into this building and they come with malice in their heart. They come with ill intent. They come with a desire to tr create chaos and stir up division in the house. And they're the ones that say, oh yeah, I know you, Jesus. I've been in this world. I'll peel back the curtain. I'll show what it really is. Bunch of hypocrites in here. That's what goes on with the unclean spirit. And then you have Nathaniel there on the other end of the spectrum. And then inside is this vast middle ground of people that come to church, right? And that vast middle ground are people that say, mm, I don't know if I want to know Jesus, right? Maybe you say you know Jesus, but you'll say it in a safe space, right? Kind of like Peter. He said it in a safe space. After all his disciples left, Jesus asked him, there's Peter with all the other disciples. And, sure, you're there with Jesus. And you're there with your close friends. You're there with your Bible study. You're there with, you know, your, your buddies that you know. They come to church with you and you'll talk about, oh yeah, I know Jesus. That's how Peter was. But we also know how Peter was, wasn't he? Don't we, when he was in the marketplace. When he was in the middle of the marketplace, we know how Jesus was. And for some of us, you know, even myself, you get into that space, and all of a sudden a little girl comes up to you and says, Oh, you were with Jesus, weren't you? Never knew him. Don't know him. Don't know him at all. Nah, you're mistaken. I wasn't with him. I have no idea who you're talking about. You see, the funny thing is, as I intermingle with people in the church and those who claim to be followers of Jesus, there's a lot of moaning that goes on about where the world is going right now, how our society is in a train wreck. Well, you know, it's, it's problematic. Barna does these uh, research studies, and most recently, as of 2020, this is absolutely heartrending for us. It should be. 75% of the population of the United States does not attend church. 75%. Whew. Now, we got churches all over the place here. They're all over. And they got people in them. Well, what's going on here, friends? 
Because of those 75%, there are some who would say, oh, yeah, I, 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 I believe in God. I, you know, I think, you know, Jesus is there. But, but it's a small percentage of that as well, actually. And there's a problem. It's a big problem. And it happens for those people that are in the middle of the continuum. Right? The Nathaniels are over here, and they're the ones that are saying, I know Jesus, I know him, and they'll speak boldly about him. And they'll speak with integrity of heart. And then you have those with the malice of intent that's saying, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. I've been in that fellowship. I see what goes on there. Pah! This is who you really are. And then you have that huge contingent in the middle there. And you get into the marketplace, and all of a sudden, hmm? Zip the lip, brother. I don't know him. I don't know him at all. I got to protect my family. I got to protect my reputation. I got to protect my job. I can't afford to put myself out there. It's too offensive. It's too troubling. I'll tell you what's troubling is I read Matthew 25. Because Matthew 25 spells it out pretty quickly right there. You want to talk about the sheep. And the goats. Because there, the sheep are falling in with Jesus, right? They're coming out. They're hearing his voice. They're coming. They're the Nathaniels, baby. They're coming in. And then you have these goats. And all of a sudden, what's Jesus say to those folks on the left? Kind of what you said while you were walking on the planet here. And the day of reckoning comes. Jesus says, I never knew you. And then you'll say, well, wait a minute. I came to church. I was doing all this work with the homeless people. I was doing blah, 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 all these things, yada, yada, yada. What the heck? Jesus says, I, I never knew you. You see, if you're coming into this building to try and energize yourself for social justice, don't come in. If you're coming into this building for the sake that this is a great place to nurture yourself to be a nice person in society, then don't come in because you come into this building to encounter a holy God that transforms lives where the Holy Spirit is at work calling into account even the demon-possessed man in the synagogue. This is a place that's holy. This isn't some place that's going to give us a shot in the arm to help us succeed in life. This is a place of holy encounter, of spiritual consequence. You come in here for that, and then you'll see the ability that you have to go out and transform lives into social justice and to be able to speak of God's truth to those who are hungering and longing to know why it is that you are the way that you are. Because you know Jesus, right? That's what it boils down to, my friends. How is it that we can speak and say, I know Jesus? Can we do that? Because it's dangerous territory when we can't. Now, here's the, here's the hopeful part of the story, right? Because Peter, yeah, he denied Jesus at least three times. At least three times. How about ourselves? Heck, I know I've done it. We've all done it at one point or another, right? And what is it that Jesus does? I love this story in John 21. There the guys are out fishing. They're not supposed to be fishing. They're not supposed to be in that boat at all. And sometimes we're where we're not supposed to be at all. We're thinking, well, I'm just going to go and do this. And Jesus responds like he does with Nicodemus with compassion. He stands there, he makes breakfast, and all of a sudden, here comes Peter, jumps off the boat, swims to shore. Jesus welcomes him, feeds him. They have a nice time around the fire. And the next thing you know, Jesus takes him for a walk, takes Peter for a walk. And what does he ask him? He doesn't ask him, do you know me? Uh -uh. Because Jesus is all about transformation. And it's taking it from the head to the heart. That's what matters. That's what God's looking for. Where is your heart? Your head is going to be swimming in this confusing world of trying to make sense of God taking on flesh. That's beyond our capacity to fully understand. You'll be wrestling with that all of your life. I can promise you that. 
you'll be wrestling with the idea of a triune God. What does that mean? How do we make sense of that? You, we can't in our terminal state. But when it moves to our heart, then we have something, right? Because then that gives us the capacity to know. And that's what Jesus asked Peter. He says, do you love me? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, I do love you, Lord. Jesus walking along. <laughs> hey, Peter. Yeah, Jesus, what's up? Do you love me? Well, well, well yeah, you know I do. Okay. Hmm. Hey, Peter. Do you love me? That's intimidating. And Peter, it's like, Jesus, I've already answered this. Yeah, of course I do. Whoa. You know, and that's where Jesus was redeeming Peter, bringing him around to give him the voice to be as Nathaniel was with that same level of enthusiasm and excitement to be able to say, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of Israel to be able to talk about that. Now, yes, yeah, certainly Jesus goes on and says, yeah, these things were done so that you might believe. And here we're sitting some 2,000 years removed and we're going, you know, Ted, I wasn't there at the crucifixion. I wasn't there at the resurrection. I wasn't there at the ascension. I can't really speak about this from a hands-on kind of eyewitness perspective. All right, granted. But you have God's truth right here. And I'm telling you what, because this is a spiritual thing and not a physical thing, you have encountered how God has been at work in your life. And you have that testimony. You have that powerful word to give witness to how it is that God is at work. And all of a sudden, that voice that you have, that you have silenced because in the public square, you've been afraid to speak that you know Jesus will open up with words of compassion to speak of the love of God that he has for you and for the circumstance and how it is that you're going to engage with your work in a manner that brings glory to God. That's what we're about here. That's what we talk about when we say we know Jesus. When people come up to us and say, why is it that, you be, that you're behaving this way? Why is it that you encounter your work in the way that you do? Why is it that you're doing this? Then you'll say, it's because I know Jesus. I mean, say, I know a man. His name's Jesus. He inspires me to do that which is honorable in his sight. And he'll probably do you well to do the same. And we'll see the transformation that takes place in this world because of the love we have for the Lord. This is what we're talking about, friends. This is what Jesus says. He says, you will see me raised up and then you will know. Hmm. You know, here's the deal. <laughs> we know and I know that you can Say, I know Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
consumed with the sinner's wrath. You lead us by still waters and to mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So we. like that that sits on us pretty heavy but the end of it saying you know there's grace involved there where Jesus comes up and says do you love me and we sing a song like this and we say your grace is a love is enough and he loves sinners like us and we wrestle with that right he wrestles with our own brokenness as we wrestle to understand him but we go out into the world bearing witness to a hopeful message that has brought transformation into your lives and you get to radiate that to the people you get to contact. Oh, my gosh. This is something that's awesome. Do not, do not put a bushel basket over your light, brothers and sisters. Get out there. You're ambassadors. And you know Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Your grace is